so removed from it that it is something that's really overlooked. And so when I came home with these fabric scraps, I started to think about them as kind of the opposite end of this supply chain. I never really even understood what a supply chain was really until I went to Bangladesh and then started to understand these complex ways that our clothes are made. And oftentimes there's all kinds of subcontracting that's going on and fabric is that made in one place and then the zippers are made in another place, et cetera, et cetera. That, that, that the supply chain is incredibly complicated. Oftentimes brands don't even know their supply chains, uh, which again, makes it very difficult for us to hold them accountable to the way that they're treating workers who are on the supply chain all along the way. So this is one of the pieces that came out of that. This is uh, a piece that is also made with the fabric scraps that I have sewn to paper. And um, this is in the show. So if you come to the show, you can see it. Um, and I hope you do. I think Suvac is doing a great job of keeping everything safe and socially distanced and requiring masks and all that. So this is a detail shot. And the reason I wanted to show you a detail shot here is that you can see how this work is made where I'm using an unthreaded sewing machine to actually create the holes in the paper. So it, this gets back to that idea of pattern, which I think is also such an interesting layer of my work. And so one of the reasons that I became very interested in the sewing machine in the first place as a drawing tool is because of this repetition of patterns. And I think the human eye is really attracted to it. And I also think it's, it is an intimate mark as Christina said earlier, I think of it in that way because this mark is really next to all of our bodies right now. Everybody who's on this talk, we've all got clothes on, I hope. And, <laughs> you know, so, and, 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 and so we actually have this mark very next to our skin and that's a very intimate thing. And it's also a very common thing. And I'm really fascinated with the way that this mark has this kind of um, poetic power, if you will. Mm -hmm. So this is just an example of a supply chain. So this is the, 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 kind of visual that also informed my work, these fabric scraps and these kinds of supply chains. This is also an early one that actually came from a, 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 it's an early drawing, again, that's in the show, so come see it. What you can see at the top is meant to be the, the consumer and on supply chains, oftentimes they go down to the retailer, the wholesaler, the manufacturer. And of course the manufacturer is much more complicated than just the manufacturer. And all of the works in this show really are responding to the, this idea of the supply chain and, and the fabric scraps. So these fabric scraps that are incorporated into these maps have not been altered in any way. One of the things I appreciate about the show is that it works almost as an installation because you can see these fabric scraps repeated in, in many different works. And I think it makes the, the, the show almost um, it, it's more of a whole, the, the works kind of unite in a larger way. And again, just some detail shots where you see both stitching and um, some holes. So I wanted to throw this image in just because one of the works in the show really um, responds to this. And I'm using this idea of map very, very metaphorically and, and loosely, I take a lot of liberty with it. So this is a photograph from the um, aftermath of the Triangle Shirtwaist fire when many women had jumped to their death rather than be burned alive in the building. And this um, work is called Map of the Aftermath. And again, it's made with fabric scraps from Bangladesh. So these white pieces are fabric scraps. Um, to me, so this piece was really about referencing the bodies lying on the sidewalk. And it's really important to me that it is made with fabric scraps from Bangladesh because I also am really trying to connect what happened in our history and what happens in other places. And that's another part of this whole story is just how, how removed we are. And so wanting to say that these stories are not disconnected, they're really the same stories. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe Rachel, we could stay on one of these detail shots um, if we can go back one slide, because I wanted to talk a little more about this mark making and the intimacy, both the intimacy of, especially in this piece, the map of the aftermath of remembering as this really personal act of also resistance, resisting these dominant narratives that sort of invisibilize um, the lives of the workers lost in this particular 
um, tragedy. But I think what these detail shots also do so beautifully, they show these different types of marks that you employ in the work, both the marks left by the unthreaded sewing machine in itself, such um, yeah, an, an object, a tool that I would like you to speak to more, but then also these incredibly um, skilled and, and disciplined hand stitches, right? Um, the way these sort of paper fabric collages are assembled. I think there's something very intimate in the mark making as well and in this combination of the tool that is voided of the thread that connects, but that that connecting work happens by hand. So could you say a little more about how you are using these marks? Yeah, I um, thank you for that that prompt. I, you know, I hope and I think that one of the things that happens when you look at this work is that you can imagine the gesture that is made, right? The, the activity of the hand becomes really present in this work because you can see um, how it's made. Again, it's almost like turning a, a shirt inside out. You can see the seam. Um, and, and so that's an important part of the stitch. There's, there's also a sense of, there's a sense of tension in the, in the way that the thread is fairly taut. And an important part about this is that it's the thread that holds the fabric scraps to the paper. So I'm not using glue or anything like that. Is it, it really is mm -hmm. about the fact that the thread is holding something together and it's both very strong and it's also very tenuous. So there's an interest, to me, there's an ambiguity in that that is really important. Uh, and that also relates to these empty holes. So these empty holes have also been made with this gesture, which to me symbolizes an act of undoing. So not every hole is filled. There is also this, I, I'm actually trying to make something by trying to take it apart or undo it or unmake it. And even the puncture of paper with a needle can, in, it's, it's a small gesture, but it can be seen as almost a violent gesture, right? It's a piercing that is happening. And so without thread, what is the purpose of it? So I almost, sometimes I like to think about the use of the sewing machine as a, um, and sewing in general as a mark that um, this idea of repair and connection is possible, but it's not certain. And I really, I, I hope to reference that social change is possible, but also not certain that it takes an incredible amount of uh, uh, kind of physical work um, that is possible, but isn't guaranteed. So it's also just this, this need for vigilance about the, the work that we do to, to repair the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think when we talked about sewing as a kind of metaphor for social change, you also talked about the perceived permanence and then the impermanence of undoing, of unmaking these marks. And in this detail shot in particular, when the orange thread sort of follows in the holes left by the sewing machine, yet it's still definitely a handmade mark, right? Um, I think some of these um, metaphoric layers really, yeah, come, come out quite beautifully. Yeah. Shall we move on to the yeah. to the next one? Yeah. So um, this is a wall drawing that was made at uh, the Perlman Museum at Carleton College. So this was two years ago. And this is called Topography of Globalization. And the images that you see here are also stencils of the shapes of the fabric scraps that are in the maps that are in the Suvac show. And so some of what this points to is the, the, the layered nature of my work. And in, in the different ways that I am using materials and kind of strategies to create imagery. So this is a detail shot, you can get a, a sense of it. And one of the ways that I work is I make stencils on an unthreaded sewing machine and then I shake powdered soft pastels through those holes directly onto walls. So I've done that in a number of different um, spaces. This particular one I, I thought was a really nice reference because the stencils that are used in this I also used, I made kind of as I was making the, the works that are in the Subak show. And I can go into the technical aspects of that if, if that's something you're interested in. But again, here's the mark of the stitch. It's a different kind of a mark, right? Because it's it's the dots. It's It re references this idea of patterns. Uh, and um, it also is meant to reference the layering and the, the piles of those fabric scraps that I showed you right at the beginning of this presentation. Um, and then this also was part of the show. Also, this same piece, Shroud, um, some of you might have seen at the MIA that was up and just closed recently at the end of October. So this, this piece is made with um, 
1,281 used white shirts, and it represents the number of people who died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire and the Rana Plaza factory collapse combined. And I'm just going to show you a couple more works that involve used clothing, um, which, you know, I had the, the idea for this piece, and the only way I figured I, I, I think when I initially considered or came up with this idea, I hadn't really figured out that I would use used clothing. I just knew that I wanted shirts to be a part of it and I wanted it to be white because it was a symbol of burial, both in Jewish and Muslim um, traditions. And then using used shirts was the only way I could afford to make it. But it quickly became very important to the work as a symbol of uh, the history of the body and all of these shirts have been worn and discarded um, and also as a symbol of um, labor. And so I've continued to do that in a number of different pieces. This is a from a show that I had uh, called How to Dismantle a System, Take it Apart, um, in which I took apart 100 pairs of used jeans. So that's what you see here is pant legs on the top row, jeans that are partly taken apart but not completely, and a, a last row of jeans also in, in the process of being taken apart. This piece was also part of that show. This is 400 uh, belt loops. Oh. Um, and just uh, one of the, this is, a, this is not a part of my work. This is just a photo from a, um, a garment factory. Uh, I'm, one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about is the factory floor and what that looks like. And so the reference to the grid and the repetition has become really important throughout. And this is a piece called Colored from my show at the MIA. Also, I had thought very carefully about how to arrange these collars and the grid became very important in, in terms of speaking to that idea of the assembly line and the factory floor. Mm -hmm. um, and this is another map, which is called the map of the factory floor, which is made up of fabric scraps and also referencing this grid and this repetition. And so I, I'm really referencing, uh, you know, you can see this in all of these different works, this idea of repetition, of a, a structure that is to some extent um, it, uh, repressive in terms of its um, lack of flow or, or lack of openness. Uh, and this is just another piece that was also at the MIA called The Bottom Line made with um, shirt plackets. Um, just before we move on into the more um, sculptural and installation based work, I wanted to revisit the mapping because there's so many layers and ways that you use the map in your work, whether it's literally the space of the factory floor, whether it is making visible, right, these intricate um, connections that run through the supply chains and you just recently told me the to illustrate the complexity of these supply chains that one can get an entire degree in supply chain management at the um, local business school, right? So maps as these multi-purpose tools that are also, I think, incredibly um, sophisticated aesthetically, right? To make visible these relationships and these connections that extend from this global capitalist system, this garment industry, down to the intimacy of the stitch and implicating the body, right? Or then the gridded factory floor. So I'm really fascinated by all these layers of what the map becomes in your work. So, sorry, I just wanted to look footnote that before we move on to talk about the bottom line here. Great. Um, you know, sometimes, and maybe this is getting a little bit ahead of our talk, but we can, we can jump back to it. Um, one of the things that has been challenging for me about making this work is it, it oftentimes feels futile. Um, and uh, um, being really immersed in this issue, I think I feel a really deep connection and, and especially having been to Bangladesh and, and interviewed people who work in the garment industry and feeling a lot of responsibility about kind of sharing knowledge that I've gained from, from them. Uh, it's oftentimes felt like whatever I can share is like such a drop in the bucket. And sometimes I have just felt like I'm just making work because I don't know what else to do. Um, and so it, it becomes this kind of expression. At the same time, one of the things that I've started to think about in my work is especially because so much of this work is about kind of these almost these these multiple kind of layers or repetitions or kind of collections of pieces and things 
um, and I think you could say that really about many of these pieces, is that as much as they are about the repetition uh, and of the factory floor, they're also about the collective, and that there is a, a, a way that I hope that these pieces also speak to that kind of the flip side, which is that the way that we address this is through the is through collective organizing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's, I just wanted to kind of throw that in because that's another kind of mapping that in some ways I hope speaks to people. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the other thing that some of these grids do, especially the ones where you have these um, long hand sort of um, stitches in them, they make visible how precarious these arrangements are, right? There's something so fragile in these, in these grids, something so tenuous that the unmaking, I think, becomes also something that is rather sort of encouraging, right? I mean, these are man-made structures, after all. These are systems that we have collectively built, right, but also built on the backs of other nations and other people. So yeah, just still thinking about the point you made about the futility. And of course, futility is never a good reason to not try something, right? But um, let's get back um, to the work. Okay. So do you want me to keep going? Yes, oh, okay. yes. Okay. So um, and just also for, for everybody who's on the talk, if you do want me to speak more about any of these pieces, I'm happy to. Um, so this uh, is another piece. I did a series that I called Cairns. So, and the, the title for the series was also about like, how do we find our way? How do we figure out what to mm -hmm. really, I'm asking how do we figure out what to do? Um, and and so, you know, and Cairns are, are something that like, if you're on a hiking trail, you find a pile of rocks that tells you where the, where the path goes. And I started to think about using these chunks chunks of concrete in my work because I was thinking a lot about well what does the aftermath of a disaster look lo looks like it looks like a bunch of rubble and again we're really disconnected from how like even what a disaster at a factory might look like and um, when I went to see that the site of the Rana Plaza factory collapse it was just a pile of rubble now granted it had been cleaned up quite a bit it was two years since but the these chunks of concrete just spoke to me in a certain way. And so this is a series of works that where I piled up pieces of concrete and wrapped them in thread. And um, the thread also being something that you would find in uh, a, 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 the aftermath of a disaster of a garment factory. I'm just gonna show you a couple pieces here. Um, uh, and but, Rachel, um, could I ask a quick question? Um, yeah. What about the scale of these pieces? So these, they're not huge. Um, these are these are all on pedestals. So like this piece is probably maybe a foot and a half high and maybe two feet wide. This one was the largest one. So, and it was pretty complicated because, you know, the thread really had to hold it together. There's no glue here or anything. Um, and so there's a lot and lot of thread. And, you know, like this was probably no more than, um, 18 inches high and maybe 12 inches wide. So they're mm -hmm. relatively small. I mean, you know, I certainly have ideas of larger, um, larger, larger projects for, for these kinds of materials. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, in these slides, seeing them without any kind of, I mean, I've seen them in person, I've had that advantage, but not seeing them with any scale, they sort of look very sort of body like themselves. And so yes, that's why I asked about the scale. Yeah. Um, maybe we could look at some of the installation work where the body is still being, you know, sort of implicated, right, or wh where the experience becomes much more visceral, and where you're also sort of scaling up. Sure. So, um, do you want me to talk about the engagement work or that just um, go back to that? Uh, we did talk about the, the the white shirts, right? I was still thinking about the way the body is um, is either present or so noticeably absent in this work. In some of the maps where you're working with the stitches, right? The body is sort of present in gesture, right? And then in the pieces that actually use clothing as in, in this one where the white shirts become really these sort of haunting ghostly specters that, but there's still such a weight to them, right? When you stand underneath them. So I, I was still thinking about how these works, um, either the body present as the, you know, executing the stitch or being um, absent in these shirts, but then also the visceral experience of standing underneath. Um, and I think, um, yeah, 
just the experience of that, the way the body is implicated and the experience becomes so visceral um, is something that I wanted to point out because that to me is another way that the work speaks when it sort of steps off the wall and becomes this sort of immersive environment. It's another way, I think, to make this work and this exploration very intimate and very felt, right? Yeah, you know, and I think as an artist, it's one of those things that it's hard to know. It's hard to know what kind of an impact our work is going to have. And I think that um, when I envisioned this work, but really all of these works in particular that work with the used clothing, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking in some ways more kind of intellectually about like what these pieces mean to me and why they would be together and why they would be in this form. And I, I can't say why I had this idea that this would be a, 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 an installation that we would be underneath, but it's just how I kind of envisioned it. And it's been really powerful for me to hear from other people the impact um, that the work has had. And again, like I've had friends, particularly at the MIA, talk about like entering the room that had shroud in it, like bursting into tears. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had so many people who I didn't know send me messages on Instagram just saying how uh, moved they were by seeing the work. I had a woman who was a dancer who I didn't know like take a video of herself dancing underneath the work and because she was very moved. Um, mm -hmm. And I had people like showing me their children walking underneath it. And so you know some of that was just being the mm -hmm. kind of the, the, the feel that it, there was a certain um, kind of amazement, I think about the, the, the sense of the work. Mm -hmm. But the fact that people were really moved again, like knowing that a, a piece of work will evoke a certain emotion that that's like impossible I think to anticipate yeah, yeah. And, but I found it moving myself that like oh this work is it, it's having it, it's it's it, it's impactful and that was mm -hmm. both like I, I can't think of something that's more satisfying as an artist mm -hmm. and um was yeah. really, you know really amazing to me to kind of learn about and and hear from people about Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, to have that really affective level of, of yeah, of being moved. Yes, yeah. But then you've also involved um, people in your work and uh, in a more participatory, deliberate form. And I think this was sort of the last layer we wanted to add in exploring um, your work. Yes, the Garment Solidarity Project, a project you did long before I ever heard about solidarity economics, but <laughs> yes, you were ahead of your time here. Well, and I think this project really grew out of a couple things. One is just wanting to have this idea of how important conversations are and thinking about conversations as a medium themselves. And, um, and it also came out of uh, this realization when I was in Bangladesh that the women who are making our clothes don't wear the same clothes that we wear. And so it seemed even more ironic that women are working in unsafe factory conditions and making, you know, paid really unfairly. And they're not even making something that they themselves would wear. And I just, I was like, oh, this is so ironic. And so I conceived of this project that I've done in public spaces. This particular photo was at, I think, the Nicollet Open Streets. I did it at a num I've done it at a num number of open streets events, which is a great place to do it because people are not necessarily expecting to see a sewing machine on the sidewalk. And this is my setup. I have a sewing machine and I have the, my, my sandwich board and I have chairs so people can come and sit with me. And I'm sewing the common clothing of the um, women in Bangladesh, which is called the shalwar kameez. It's kind of a loose fitting tunic and loose fitting pants. And I'm just sewing that in public space and then really having conversations because everybody wants to come see what I'm doing or not everybody, but a lot of people are very curious. And so I've been having very, I think, important and one-on-one -on -one conversations about this issue. And um, it's been really powerful. Uh, it's an ongoing project. And, um, and then this is just something that I started this summer, thanks to John Sherman with his kind of encouragement. This is uh, an unmaking. And so I invited neighbors on my block to come and um, unmake a shirt with me. And so you can see we're socially distanced, everybody's wearing masks. So um, I asked everyone to bring a shirt and I gave everyone a seam ripper and I told them how to rip a seam. And here people are taking apart a shirt. So we spent an hour on a Sunday afternoon taking apart shirts together. Um, and, and then after we took the shirts apart, we laid all the parts of the shirts 
down on the avenue and had a conversation about the experience. And this was completely experimental. I had no idea what it would be like. I had been taking shirts and jeans apart for a really long time. And so I'm like, but I had this idea that, well, what ha would happen if I invited other people to do that? And I felt that it was very powerful. We had a really interesting conversation about what it meant to take something apart. And it made people think more deeply about their clothing and about how their clothing was made and who made it and all these things. And the, the question of what's next is always in my mind, but I think um, this was, a, I'm excited about this as one of the many kind of next directions for, um, for my work um, and mm -hmm. is engaging more people together in this process. Mm -hmm. And um, given that so much of this particular project is about process, is about participation, is about conversation and dialogue and really these individual one-on-one -on -one conversations as sort of a catalyst to perhaps raise awareness or a changed relationship to the clothes we wear. Do you think about this work as sort of um, socially engaged practice or how do you see these um, these final two projects that you showed in relation to this, to this um, yeah, very popular term? Um, absolutely. I, I see these as socially engaged projects. Yeah. Be, and because that's what they're doing. Um, and this one, I think I'm, I'm particularly happy with because it really, it involves other people in the physical activity. And there is, I think there's no substitute for actually what it's like to take apart a seam mm -hmm. and, 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 and look at that and, and see the thread and, and think about how fabric is joined together. So in the, you know, it's almost, it's like baking or something, right? It's like, how, how is, how do you put things together? Taking apart something helps you to understand that process. Mm -hmm. And doing it in community was also really interesting. I mean, we had a great conversation. Um, people had different insights and uh, it was really fun to do it just in my neighborhood and see what people had to say to each other. And um, I had made a commitment that I was going to send people an email out about this time of year, just to remind them and to ask them if they'd kind of thought of this activity kind of, you know, since and had it impacted their behavior at all. You know, one of the things that happens to me that tends to happen a lot is that when I see people who have seen my work, they often will say that it has made them think more about their clothing. Like mm -hmm. it, it's, and, and so I'm interested in continuing to kind of figure out how to do that in, in stronger and deeper ways. Mm -hmm. and I think it's so yeah, I feel like at this point, we have a really good sort of overview of the different approaches you've taken to engaging with the subject from these intimate mementos, the cairns to the to the multiple different maps, whether they are mapping the geographical span of the industry or these vertical um, supply chains from the performances and the interactive pieces to the more sculptural works that are really immersive experiences. So perhaps at this point, it is time that we turn to politics and to the activist dimension in your work. And let me find the right page on my notes here. So clearly you do understand your work as a form of activism. And um, here it seems with this particular project, the idea was really to get people to think more about their relationship to these objects that we have such intimate relations with. But what are perhaps in your ideal world, the kind of actions you want this work to inspire, or you hope that um, people will, you know, even though we can't predict things, right? But um, sort of in your ideal world, what, what are the actions that you hope that this work will propel? So it's such a good question because it's definitely something I've been thinking about since I started making this work. Um, and even before this, I started on this work, you know, you, you remember the work that I was doing um, on seed saving, you know, I thought mm -hmm. a lot about, so, so all my work, I think I'm, I'm really focused on how do, how, how can my work lift up issues that I think are important, like more important than just my work, right? Like how does work connect to larger issues? And I think that um, it's been, both really fascinating and also frustrating to kind of see the, the challenges around ad addressing the garment industry, be, partly because the garment industry is so big. I mean, we're really talking about capitalism. And so, um, you know, I, I joke a lot about like my work is about smashing capitalism and, and, and it is, but, um, but it's in terms of the, you know, what steps can we take? I think it's complicated. I think that there has, you know, there, there are certainly like 
a lot of important things that we can all do individually. But, the, and this is where my frustration has come out is that that alone just it will not solve the problem. It's kind of like, you know, we put our plastic bottles in the recycling and that is not taking care of the plastic problem in the world, right? I think that's a really good metaphor. And it's the same thing, like you can buy used, which is great, but that does not solve this problem of how garment workers are treated. We will all continue to buy our underwear at Target and somebody makes those underwear. And, and so the, there are some, um, emer you know, especially I think it's interesting the COVID, I think, has actually given rise to some really promising um, international efforts to address what's happening in the industry, partly because what COVID did is that many brands shut down orders that they had already made, orders, clothing that had already been made but just hadn't been shipped to brands. Brands just started to refuse to pay for it, which meant that not only were workers out of the money, but the factories themselves. Not that I'm saying factory owners are are like great people, but it really put um, millions of people, especially in South Asia, at great risk in terms of hunger and mm -hmm. where there's no safety net. And and that uh, kind of um, um, what happened in Europe and the United States was a big campaign to make these um, brands pay up. And so that has emerged into a larger movement about pressuring um, brands to play their role in how they're treating garment workers. One of the big problems is that most brands don't own the factories where their clothes are made. And so it's very easy for brands to throw up their hands and say, it's not our fault. And, and so there's this kind of gap of, of hold being able, like who do we hold accountable? And I think that's starting to shift. And so, I mean, in a nutshell, the solutions are really about collective action and they are about pressuring brands to do better and treat workers better. And I think there's a lot we can do. A lot of that is channeled, channeled through these um, international NGOs. And I think that's really where it has to happen. I, I'm just, I'm always so struck though by people, like when, when I came back from Bangladesh, people would say, well, just tell me where I should shop, you know, mm -hmm. where, where, or who shouldn't, whose clothes shouldn't we buy? Like mm -hmm. that was the easy fix, right? Like we have a hundred shops we could go to. It's, it's no, you know, it's easy for us to not go here and go here instead. And so it's a much bigger or harder question about, well, what else should we do in addition to that? And so I don't mean to like say it's like, it's great to buy used. It's great to buy fair and ethically made things. That's, there's nothing, that's wonderful, but that alone won't solve this big problem. Mm -hmm. And so it really mm -hmm. does take a much bigger movement. Yeah. And of course, there's also layers of economic complexity, right? Who can afford to make that choice to buy fair, to buy sustainable, um, who is willing to make a choice to buy used. So yes, it, I mean, it's an economic issue um, that comes with its own layering of complexities. It's an ecological issue, right? Thinking about the garment factories being such a, a yeah, force of pollution. And of course, it's an ethical issue as well that ties into labor rights and um, and the question of what should be done, right? And what art can or if art can, in fact, contribute to um, spawning this kind of collective action. But I think for me, where I see your work's contribution is that it really makes these big abstract systems available to experience, right? This, this way of moving people, of making these abstract and sometimes systems that feel so daunting and so removed, even though we're in such intimate contact with the clothes we wear, right, that it makes that available to experience. Now, I have a follow up question here that um, references an article that Sheila Regan wrote about your work for hyperallergic. And in that piece, you are quoted saying, um, part of being Jewish is being an activist and working for social change. And I had never heard you talk about that connection between your Jewish identity and this, I mean, obviously the garment industry, you mentioned the seed saving project earlier is not the first one where you've engaged with um, social change and activism. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that um, connection a little bit. Sure, thanks for that question. I, I really appreciate it. You know. Absolutely. My Jewish identity is, you know, a, a, a hugely important part of who I am and my desire to have my work have, a, I don't want to say impact, I really want to say contribution, make a contribution mm -hmm. towards um, making the world a better place that absolutely comes from being Jewish and it's kind of how I understand what it means to be Jewish in the same way that 
it is about um, kind of that I, I, as a human being, I have a responsibility to do my part to make the world a better place for humans and, and, and the environment. And so kind of coming from that place that drives a lot of my work and it drives how I think about what I want to make work about. Mm -hmm. the, this whole project really, this whole large project really emerged when the Rana Plaza factory collapse happened. I also connected it to the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire because it was a story that I knew about. And I knew about it because most of the women who died in that fire were Jewish immigrants. My family was also a family of Jewish immigrants. They didn't work in the garment industry, but it's a it's a history that that I claim, and so I felt connected in that way, and also because um, many of these Jewish um, immigrants, women, were also um, leaders in the textile organizing efforts to um, kind of stand up and fight for workers' rights, and so and that's also something that I claim with a lot of pride, but it also means like I I, I really kind of acknowledge that, that that work is not over, it's not done, it mm -hmm. continues. And um, and so I, yeah, I feel a kind of a sense of responsibility um, and and a connection to that, that tradition mm -hmm. of standing up for social justice and speaking mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And having your work make that commitment and carry that forth. Yeah, um, in that same context, um, you've also been a teacher for a number of years. Do you see your teaching as an extension of activism or do you see your work as an opportunity to teach? What's what's that relationship? What's that dialogue like? Um, that's a great question. Absolutely. It's it's a, a huge opportunity to have dialogue and um, in in and I feel like communicate about kind of why art is important, um, both on the, the, the most minute level, you know, you teach drawing students that drawing is about seeing right? Mm -hmm. It is about looking carefully uh, and responding and, and mm -hmm. expressing and, and, and those things. But art is also about communicating about our world. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely, it's, it's and you know, I, I find lots of ways to bring in um, um, that ideas of values and, and, and ethics mm -hmm. in, in our work. And that as artists, we all have a lot of responsibility about uh, um, the subject matter that, that we choose to respond to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that in itself is a, is a matter of choice, right, that communicates something about values, what is noteworthy, what is worth paying attention to, right? I mean, that is sort of where, where ethics begins, in a way, in the way art communicates and in making, um, yeah, in, in noticing the responsibility in that. Um, so, a personal question. Since you started working on this subject, um, has your own relationship to clothing changed? Um, oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I can't um, go into a store. I haven't been into a clothing store recently, but up until COVID, um, you know, I couldn't go into a, a clothing store and not think about where the clothes are made, think about the factory floor um, deeply. And so I actually started to find it kind of difficult to go into some I mean, department stores or um, clothing stores. And um, especially just, just thinking about the, the numbers of thinking about waste, really thinking mm -hmm. about waste and overconsumption. Mm -hmm. and, the, um, and at the same time, I, um, you know, I, I cert I've always actually bought used for, for a lot of my clothes. I've done that since I was in high school. So that, that wasn't a, any kind of a shift for me. In some ways, it's just, I think a lot about how, how much we don't need Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, research that has been done about how, mu how much, what clothes we wear that we already own and what clothes we don't wear that we already own. And, and something about, you know, like we wear 10% of what we own. And like, so the top layer in your, um, in your drawer is what you wear. And then most of us have, I don't know, most of us, I know I have, you know, a layer mm -hmm. of clothes under that top layer that maybe I haven't worn in a year or maybe even two years. And, and, and that's true of many of us. So just the amount of stuff that we have that we don't need is really kind of mind boggling. And I have certainly from collecting all of the used clothing that has been a part of my um, work, I, I would be going to the Goodwill outlet and knowing that, you know, 
6% of what is donated to Goodwill either ends up in the landfill or is sent to, um, over to Africa or South Asia in containers where it is, we flood their used clothing market. Mm -hmm. I'm also just really aware of how much, not only how much crap we have, but how much crap we get rid of and where there's no place for it to go. And it just makes yeah. me want to pull my hair out. So if anything, it, it's more just about like, I don't, I don't want us to, we just, need so little we need we need so much less than most of us have and mm -hmm. that has become really apparent to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and then of course going back to the environmental concerns right how much of this wasted clothing clothing then ends up in landfills but now is made from artificial fibers that no longer decompose so there's there's that ecological um nightmare as well um i'm nearing the end of the questions I have, there's one more question that comes with a quotation that I will ask Rachel, but I'm, um, Alison, if you're monitoring the chat, we can, we can switch to um, questions from all of you really soon. And Rachel, I don't know if we still, I mean, it's lovely to look at, at this image of your neighborhood, but maybe it would also be nice <laughs> to see people. <laughs> Um, so the final question that I wanted to ask, I, there's still a few, but I'm aware of time here. Um, as I mentioned, begins with a quotation. Um, Nusheen Hakim um, recently, well, it's two years ago actually already, um, brought Cristobal Martinez to the university. Um, Cristobal Martinez, who is one of the members of an indigenous art collective called Post Commodity. And at that artist talk, um, Cristobal said these very memorable sentences. I'm just gonna read them, bear with me. Um, he said, the time for art to simply point out what is wrong is over. We need more than critique, more than protest. We need healing. We need art to mediate complexity. And that really gave me pause when I first heard um, him say that. Um, and certainly there is still a need for art to also be a voice of protest. But I'm also curious um, about this, we need art to mediate complexity and we've had um, a long history of very vocal protest art, perhaps especially um, in this country. But I was curious how you sort of engage with a statement like that, how you position or yeah, how you dialogue um, with that, um, thinking about your work with both its formal complexity, but also its, its activist and political dimensions. Well, wow, it's a great question. I, I, really, I really love that. Um, a couple things, you know, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, which is this idea of that I hope that my work provides a critique, but also maybe points to the need for the collective and collective action. And that is, um, I think that is the direction that I'm going with my work as I think about what com is coming next. Um, I'm interested in do focusing more on um, collective uprisings. So I'm really interested in doing some research about the Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts, along with the uprising of the 20,000 that happened um, after, was it after or before, but in, in New York, um, the, the textile workers did an, some incredible mobilization. Um, but just, and, a, and looking at other, there just was a huge, um, huge protest in India. I think it was mostly a farmer's 250 million people. I mean, it, so I'm really interested in looking at and thinking about protest movements. And I'm also really interested in solidarity economies and, and looking at what that looks like and how, how do we imagine that visually? Um, so I, I'm really thinking about that as some next steps because I, I, I yeah, it just feels like I've, I've done a lot of critiquing and I really want to make more prominent and maybe more explicit um, ideas about solutions. So, so in terms of mediating complexity, um, I guess, I guess the, the one other thing I would say about the work that I've done so far is that um, I don't think that it points to what the answers are very clearly. And in some ways that may be an advantage and that it is ambiguous that I am just raising the questions and encouraging people to think about that. Um, I know for instance, um, one of the didactics in, my, in the MIA show was about the piece collared. And um, one of the things I mentioned there is that um, when I spoke to people in women in Bangladesh, one of the questions that I would ask everyone is, well, if you could speak to the people who buy your clothes in the United States, what would you say? And overwhelmingly, the response was, um, don't boycott our clothes. Mm -hmm. And 
and even international NGOs have been really clear about boycotts not being beneficial to garment workers and that not being a strategy that they wanted, that they encourage people to, to use. I think that's really interesting, right? And so again, it, it, it really speaks to the need for us to play a role in pressuring brands to treat workers more fairly. And so this, this question of the solution is not um, so explicit. And, and, and in some ways that it raises question. My, I, I hope again that my work maybe raises the question and encourages people to think about it because in some ways that's one of the most important things. I'm not like the person to be saying like what the solution is, but encouraging mm -hmm. us to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in addition to raising the question, it's also making the urgency of this issue available to experience, right? The, the, the ways that you talked about earlier, how people feel moved, that that is something that art can do, right? As it mediates complexity, that we also very immediately experience something, feel something and begin perhaps to care in some cases. Um, well, on that note, Alison, are there any questions that we wanna share from the chat? Sure, yeah, there is, and I mean, I might, some comments were of the moment, so I might skip over those. And I think I'll consolidate one from uh, Betty Teethel. She started out saying that Rachel's work makes me think of the tension of the workers to continuously maintain quality and cleanliness and consistency as they work under pressure. Uh, and she also brought up after the pandemic would you actually travel the shows to places like Midtown Global Market or inside clothing stores that might appeal to brands with conscience? More or less taking it out of the museum and gallery setting and placing it in a way in which it would be in front of those that actually aren't aware of these problems. Sure. Um, yeah, great question. I mean, you know, one of the projects that I'm thinking about, I'm planning on doing some research about um, sites of garment industries in the Twin Cities and possibly outstate, but there are some former garment factories in the Twin Cities and I'm really interested in doing some installation work outside. So that's something that I'm planning on doing um, both, again, twofold to kind of make more visible the our connection to our clothes um, in a space that's outside the gallery, but also to connect it to our own history, that there have been labor, there, 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 were, there have been garment factories here in the Twin Cities, um, even up until really recently that um, the Munsingwear plant like used to make long underwear and actually, you know, for many years we had garment factories here and I know there's some, some labor history, important labor history. So uh, again, wanting to say this is not just stuff that happens on the other side of the planet. It's, it, it has happened right here and even happens here today. I think that there are, there's some small scale factories and I don't know much about them, um, but there are some particularly of sportswear. I know that that, that is made we, we make a lot of cross-country ski uniforms and bike racing uniforms in Minnesota. So that's that's on my list to research. Um, and yeah, and, and I would love for this work to be in many places outside of the gallery. So that's that's something to investigate for sure. It's yeah, to both your next activity. <laughs> No, both to make it go public, right? And I mean, with the social engagement pieces, there is already a kind of public presence, but then to even make it sort of site specific in terms of where um, these mappings, for instance, take place, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so that actually, I'm just gonna skip to another question that has relevance to this conversation and go back to uh, one in just a second. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on the radical transparency ethically made companies such as Girlfriend Collective and Everlane, is this a direction that shows positive system change? And that is from uh, Sarah Nasif. So um, I think Girlfriend Collective is, a, I, from what I know about them, um, I think they're great and um, they're uh, doing some really good work. I think they're a little bit better than Everlane. I think Everlane is, I've heard some criticism of Everlane. I, you know, I don't know if, there, there's a lot of stuff written about how good are all these companies? Um, again, I mean, I think they're great. I think 
they do a better job. And I think the Girlfriend Collective, they, they take plastic bottles and turn it into fabric and they make leggings and tops and stuff. And um, I think they pay their workers well and it's very like body positive in terms of their models. And um, the, there's, they're great, but to me, they're just not the, they're just not the solution. We can't shop our way out of this problem. And so just buying stuff is not gonna, and it's, you know, so it's part of it. It's a piece of it, absolutely. And I think it's, if you can, I think it's great to support them. I have a pair of leggings from Girlfriend Collective. I love them, buy their stuff. Like, but um, there's just, there's only so far that, that those companies go in terms of this bigger picture. Um, did that answer that question? Yeah, no, I think that's great. Yeah. Um, and now I'm gonna, there's a question up here that I think is really interesting that speaks more to um, materials. Um, have you ever considered letting one or more of the threads go slack? What would that mean if anything? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So uh, in the, um, in the show that I did, How to Dismantle a System, Take It Apart, where I took apart 100 pairs of jeans, I did have um, all the thread that I took out of the jeans. I hung them up on the wall, just the thread, and it was it was a beautiful piece um, that I, I really loved. Even the way that the thread actually kept its shape, that it, it didn't just become straight, it actually kept a, a almost this interesting, it's it's a beautiful part of that show. I um, and And it's, yeah, so, I think there's lots to do with um, lots of ways thread could be worked on for sure. It's a re I mean, thread is such an interesting material um, because it is so strong and it is so fragile at the same time. It's, it's a really, it's fascinating in that way. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, and then there's in that same line of questions, uh, someone asks, I'm curious about your thoughts on the visible work like machine done embroidery or other embellishments on clothing. Uh, I'm not actually sure what that question is asking, but I think um, it may be an interesting scenario of what you choose to leave on the clothes and what you take away. Uh, because there's some, some of your clothing has embellishments and other installations that you've done are free of embellishments. And I don't know if that is in regard to the clothes that you find or a more conscious choice. What's interesting, you know, a lot of like, if you buy um, clothing in a department store that has some kind of hand embroidered decoration, it was probably done by somebody who was working at home um, and then they take their finished work back to a factory. And so um, it's like sub, sub, sub contracting. And oftentimes, um, even if they're working at home, um, there there are no protections and there's n absolutely no guarantees about salary and or that people get paid. So it, it creates, um, and people are paid, you can absolutely be certain that they're paid really poorly. Um, so that that's just important. Um, if, if, and and then in terms of, but also I, I do embroider and I like to embroider. And so that's definitely something that could potentially show up in some of my work down the road if, if that was a question. Yeah. I'm also just gonna, um, I'm putting a couple links in the chat. Um, one, the first one is um, Pay Up Fashion. So that's the campaign that I mentioned earlier that started. If people are interested, you, there's a petition you can sign and um, just learn more about what is happening um, within kind of the activists who are, uh, working to address the, the larger issues around the garment industry. If you would like to direct a contribution directly to people doing organizing work in Bangladesh, the Awaj Foundation, um, there's a donate button right here and that's um, run by a really great um, Bangladeshi activist and it's specifically uh, an organization that works with garment workers in Bangladesh. And finally, We Are Threaded is um, a really great effort run by um, Ashlyn Przewski, Ashlyn, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correct. Um, Ashlyn has done a, real, a lot of really great work around local ethical um, fashion. And um, it's just a website that has a, a lot of, a compilation of lots of people locally who are making their own stuff. So if you do wanna support local stuff, that's it's a great resource. So. Thank you for that, Rachel. Yeah. And so does anyone have any other questions? We still have, I mean, we're, 
we're past one, but we're more than willing to stay and chat a little more. Oh, here, whoa, <laughs> here's something um, from Emmett. Uh, your work makes me reflect on the garment workers making these clothing items that you are then taking apart and having community members take apart and displaying this feels like a symbolic undoing of labor that makes me really curious. Um, that's a really great question. And, and that was actually a question that actually came up this summer when we were unmaking, um, doing our, our unmaking is that people said they felt uncomfortable, like they were taking apart somebody's work and that that was not right. It was such an interesting question because um, on the one hand, um, I felt like that un level of discomfort was a really great experience for people to think about because it created a kind of an aha movement or just again it was a way to connect more deeply with the people who make our work it was really it was also really interesting to me because all of the clothing in all of my installations was used and um it's th those clothes will not go back into circulation and whenever i would go to the goodwill outlet and like literally come out of the goodwill outlet with a, a grocery cart piled high with clothes because you buy clothes by the pound there so i would always buy like between 50 and 70 pounds which would cost me about 50 dollars, and i would fill up the back of my truck and bring it home and wash it and and work with it i always felt like i was liberating those clothes from the landfill i was saving them from where they were going and so so emmett for me it was very much about like recognizing that if i didn't do something with these clothes where were they going to end up and, and, and it's also, that's a way that we're also really disconnected with this idea of overconsumption and what happens with all the stuff we have. We've, I have talked to so many people who drop stuff off at the Goodwill or Salvation Army and feel like they're doing such a good deed. They're giving to charity. And it's not that it's wrong to give to those places. That's not what I'm saying. But understanding what actually happens to that stuff when it goes there is really important. And that most of it, 80% of what we donate just it's it's not going to get resold. It's going to go to a landfill, or it's going to be resent to you know sent in a container over to another country, displacing jobs, or or oftentimes winding up in their landfill because oftentimes what gets sent in containers to these countries is stuff that's ripped or stained. It's the stuff we got rid of, and nobody wants to buy it in Africa either. And so it goes to the landfills there. And so I'm sorry, I'm like my voice is. This is really like oh my god. This is like. It's so messed up that this is a system, right? And so like, what if I was on this panel for the Tangletown neighborhood? It was a really interesting panel. And, you know, everybody wants to do what, say everybody was concerned because, well, Hennepin County doesn't recycle used textiles anymore. So what can we do? And I said, well, what if you had to take care of all that stuff? What if you had to, in your, in your yard, what if you had to figure out what, to, in the confines of your like house or your yard, if you had to, if you couldn't give it away and you had to deal with it, what would you do? Well, you could cut your shirt up into rags for cleaning your bicycle, or you could, you know, but then what? What after that rag's all greasy? What do you do then? Like, what if you have to deal with it till the end? That, you know, that's the kind of the question that I want to raise. Again, it gets back to the consumption. So if it makes somebody uncomfortable to take apart a shirt, I say, good, that's great. And it raises up these larger questions about how we consume and how we, how we discard things and, what, and how responsible we are for these things that we own and, and what happens to them, I guess. Nice. Yeah, sorry to rant. No, and now I'm gonna, stir your pot a little more and combine two questions. Uh, one is a question that is about, do you know any worker owned factories or clothing companies? And then I'm gonna go ahead and fold in another question that asks, uh, Goodwill has its own set of immense ethical challenges. Uh, and have you thought about how to speak to that? Um, so let me answer the last question first, and then I'll go back to the, um, the first one, which you're going to have to remind me of. Um, I guess, I mean, I think that from what, so I'm not sure what ethical challenges you're referring to. I think that, um, from what I know about Goodwill, I do think that they have gotten better about, um, 
finding pla places for their stuff. And there's a book, there was a, a speaker who's actually from Minnesota who now lives in Asia, um, who wrote this book all about, well, disposal. Sorry, I don't have it at the tip of my tongue. But he, anyways, he actually was on a panel that I saw along with the head of Goodwill. And they talked about how, how Goodwill has actually gotten better than it was about finding places for its stuff. Like they divide it up and like, in, especially outside of the US, a lot of electronics can actually be repurposed. You know, there's actually laws against like actually re like fixing stuff. And um, so there, there's some like ways that Goodwill has done better. Um, it's interesting that uh, I'm happy that there are some avenues for repurposing clothing, right? Like the, the fact that some of our clothing can be like donated and resold is a good thing. That's, that's not bad. The problem, so I'm not really speaking to the issue of goodwill. I, I guess I just don't really know about that. But, but I think that it's great that some of our stuff can be repurposed. Like that's a good thing. Um, the problem is just that we just have too much. We're getting rid of too much stuff because we have too much stuff in the beginning. And that's, that's my frustration. And what was the first question, Allison? Sorry. Um, it was just a question of, do you know of any worker owned factories? Yeah. So in the chat, in the, the link that I posted, we are threaded. There are some worker owned factories, I think even here in the Twin Cities, they're super small. When I was in Bangladesh, I um, actually visited a worker owned cooperative. It was actually formed by survivors of the Rana Plaza factory collapse. Um, eight people, they had taken some of their compensation money and formed their own factory and we visited them and it was really awesome. Also small, there were eight workers there. I have not stayed in touch with them. So I don't know if they're still um, making clothing or where they're selling. Um, so I, I actually think, that, and I have read, like, I think there are a, a few and I think they're sprinkling up. I think there's some actually in, I wanna say the Dominican Republic. Um, and I think there's actually, there's there's some pretty interesting factories that have responded to, um, th there's a, this is not the right word, but college without sweatshops, or there's, there's a whole movement of college students organizing to make sure that, um, college campus clothing, you know, sweatshirts that have your, you know, University of Minnesota, whatever, are not made in sweatshops. And that's been actually very successful, be, partly because it's been very targeted. And I think the factories that they work with, I think they're in the Dominican Republic. Um, and then also in India and in Vietnam, there are some. And, and that is one benefit of some of the ethical kind of consumer businesses that are starting is that there are some, but they're just small. It's, it's just small compared to these corporate brands. I mean, the h and m it's so big. It's just so big, you know, in comparison to these very small worker owned cooperatives. And so I think the worker owned cooperatives are great. I just um, can't stop thinking about the workers who are in, in, in these very, very large um, factories. And for most people that that's their only option. That's good. Great questions. Um, there is one, and I might ask that Ann George clarify just slightly because she's asking, I'd like to consider how the supply chain doesn't end with the diagram shown. It includes American artists working in the supply chain of grants, exhibitions, museums, viewers, etc. Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm not totally sure what she's asking. Maybe you are. Well, it sounds like you're kind of making an analogy, Anne. And Anne, if you want to unmute yourself and just yeah. right, that's that's fine. I was muted. Um, <laughs> it occurred to me how with a, with the supply chain, you know, for um, for production of goods, it it should include us as consumers and and even as art makers, as as we if we're exploring those topics art makers yeah. and exhibitors and grant givers and stuff like that's that's a continuous economy from those women who make those goods to us sitting here <laughs> and and i think i think that's a transparency that is interesting would be interesting to explore mm -hmm. yeah there is actually an artist um renzo martins 
who has moved to the Central Republic of Congo and has started working with plantation workers there to do just that, to create alternative supply chains and to explore fully the complicity of himself as a white artist who's internationally successful and who's also the legacy of like the colonial system in the Central Republic of Congo. And then um, to create these, to intervene in these supply chains that Rachel was mapping, that he's also mapping. There's an excellent artist talk that he gave I think a few years ago at Goldsmiths College in London online where he sort of charts the supply chains and then tries to create these alternative models and these alternative supply chains again starting very small but also going from the economic problem to the ecological impact what would it mean to actually stop plantation labor in the Congo and to stop monocultures for palm oil etc so it, I think it, it shares with Rachel's work these multiple layers that economy ties into ecology, ties into aesthetics, ties into, as you were pointing out, um, into the complicity of the artist then making work about that and also benefiting from that. And so in Martin's work, he very much harnesses his own privilege um, as a successful artist to then, um, yeah, have that sort of funnel back and figure out how to disrupt that system. It's complex work and I'm probably not doing it justice, but I just wanted to throw it out there that yes, um, those attempts are also happening, right? And they're very exciting. Thanks. Thanks for answering that. Great. Um, so, Christina, do you have any last minute questions for Rachel, words of wisdom for us to leave, either of you? <laughs> no words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Rachel, for inviting me to have this conversation with you. It was a pleasure to re-engage with your work. Oh, Christina, I just want to thank you so much for your really thoughtful um, questions and and commentary, it, it really means so much to me. And thank you again to Allison and Carolyn and the SUVAC, the SU Visual Art Center. I just really invite all of you to come to see the work. Um, the, the gallery will be reopened at some point. And, and, and so please come see the work. I, um, I'm really, I just want, would close by saying I'm really proud of this work. Um, I have worked on it for a number of years. And, you know, it's, it's this work it's just, it's very different from the work, for instance, that was at the MIA um, because it really has involved the hand, it involves sitting and, and being very intimate with it. And um, and I'm, I'm also really happy with how it intersects and layers with the, the other work that I've done. So I hope you come see it. And um, I'll just, at, in closing, I'll just take a moment to, um, for all of us, and wanna encourage all of us to take a moment and just thank the people who have made the clothes that we're wearing today and to um, thank them for their their labor and um, and all the things, all the things, the computers, the people who put together our computers, all, you know, all the all the workers who make our our lives um, and the, the, the wonderful things in our lives um, possible um, to thank them. So thank you all for being here and that's it. Be safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks to everyone. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.